Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Stefanos Fasoulas. I'm the director of the Institute of Space Systems here at the University of Stuttgart. The Institute has about 150 co-workers, including 60 to 70 PhD students, five full professors and five more honorary and assistant professors. So it's practically impossible to me to give a brief introduction into our research projects. As a compromise, I've asked some of our international PhD students to introduce themselves and also to give a brief introduction into their work. So, if you're interested, come with me or say it in Greek. Elate Mazimo. My name is Ashley Tedwick and I was born in the South Australian city of Adelaide. What you see is the tank where I test alternative propellants for space propulsion, specifically what you would find in uh, crewed missions or in other atmospheres that we can harvest. I came to the IRS specifically because they offer a, uh, a large flexibility in the research, so I have control over my own program here. Hola, em dic Gisela i vinc de Barcelona. El meu projecte de recerca és l'anàlisi de fiabilitat dels sistemes de control ambiental i suport a la vida per assegurar la supervivència dels astronautes per a missions de llarga durada, com per exemple un viatge a Mart. Estic aquí a l'Institut de Sistemes Especials per les grans possibilitats que ofereix en el camp de la recerca, especialment en missions tripulades. Привет, меня зовут Павел Ницынков, и я родился в России, в сибирском городе Омск. Тема моей кандидатской диссертации – компьютерное моделирование входа космических систем, как, например, Space Shuttle, в атмосферу на базе метода прямого Монте-Карло. Я выбрал Институт космических систем из-за очень интересной темы и компетентных коллег в научной работе. Намасте. Мира нам Прошан Кашвекар, и я Индия Сеум. मेरा पीएचडी का संशोधन सोफिया योजना का एक हिस्सा है सोफिया का मतलब स्टेटोस्फेरिक ऑब्जर्वेटरी फॉर इंफ्रारेड एस्ट्रोनॉमी ये स्पेस संस्था ऐसे कई रसप्रद योजनाओं का घर है और यहाँ पे वैज्ञानिक संशोधनों के लिए कई आधुनिक सुविधाएं उपलब्ध है ये मेरा सौभाग्य है कि मैं ये अद्भुत संस्था का हिस्सा जिससे कई सारे आशावादी लोग जुड़े हैं mi nombre es Santiago López y vengo de Medellín, Colombia. En el Instituto de Sistemas Espaciales investigo cómo las temperaturas y campos magnéticos críticos de algunos materiales superconductores dependen de su estructura cristalina. Un mejor entendimiento de estos materiales permitiría desarrollar superconductores que trabajen a temperaturas cada vez más elevadas y en el campo aeroespacial, por ejemplo, podrían utilizarse para mejorar la eficiencia de los propulsores eléctricos o también para reemplazar rodamientos y trenes de aterrizaje por medio de la levitación magnética o también para crear man campos magnéticos elevadísimos que podrían proteger a una nave durante la entrada atmosférica. My name is Rachel and I'm from New Zealand. My work here at the ERS involves modeling of cometary streams in the solar system to predict meteor storms of the Earth and also to understand the danger that these particles can pose to spacecraft. Working here provides me with the opportunity to work on an ESA-funded project that plans to map the impact hazard to spacecraft and interplanetary missions. So, this has been a brief introduction of what we are doing here in research in the Space Center by Gutenberg. If you're interested for more details, just visit our web page. Welcome to Stuttgart, uh, here in my office within the Space Center of Baden-Württemberg, uh, to this final lecture within the MOOC at TO9 lecture course network. I've chosen for this uh, lecture the topic uh, orbital mechanics, and I was really wondering whether this would be of interest for you, and I was really thinking um, to give maybe some basic information, some fundamental information, um, uh, on some, from something which is, um, um, let's say, um, mandatory for every space mission we consider. You have heard in the previous lecture about small satellites uh, orbiting the Earth. We have um, more space missions um, orbiting the Earth, for example, even larger satellites as the International Space Station in the so-called LEO, LEO or Low Earth Orbit. We have satellites um, uh, for planetary missions, um, even maybe landing on different planets and maybe one day also returning from there, for example as shown here in Mars simple return mission. We have um, 
satellites orbiting other planets. We have satellites landing on moons, as for example the Huygens probe, which landed some years ago on the Saturn moon, uh, moon Titan. And um, last but not least, maybe we have also telescopes uh, at different locations uh, near the Earth or farther away from the Earth, um, giving us um, tremendous uh, insight into the universe surrounding us, but also um, in, in Earth observation, uh, giving us information about uh, what ha what's happening on our Earth, within the atmosphere of our Earth and, and um, many things more. So all these missions um, um, are covered by the fundamental understanding of um, orbital motion called orbital mechanics and that's the reason why I've chosen this topic to give a brief introduction um, going on here. Well, the lesson objectives are therefore uh, to give answers to some typical fundamental questions, for example, why does a satellite stay in orbit, or even identical the question, is an astronaut weightless, as we will see very soon. Um, other question might be, which orbit types can we realize, and which velocities do we need for these orbits. And finally, I will give a brief introduction also to the task of the week, um, I would like you to give an answer on the following question. Do we feel on Earth the gravitational pull of the Sun? So, let's start. Uh, the basics um, for the investigation of this orbital mechanics um, were given by Newton. Um, just to recapitulate um, Newton's laws of motion, um, which he published in 1687, some uh, centuries ago, uh, the first law states, unless acted upon an unbalanced force, an object will maintain a constant velocity, and what is important to note, in magnitude and direction. The second law states, an applied force is equal to the rate of range of momentum, momentum defined as the product of mass and velocity of an object. Third law states, all forces occur in pairs, and these two forces are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. And finally, Newton was also able to um, derive the universal gravitational law, which states that every point mass attracts every other point mass by a force directed along the line connecting, connecting the two. This force is proportional to the product of the masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Or, in mathematical formula, it's stated here. Uh, it's important to note, maybe, that uh, Newton was not able to, um, uh, to measure the gravitational constant, denoted here as gamma. This was also some um, decades after him. He had a rough estimation about the order of magnitude, um, well, it was a good estimation, by the way. Um, the best known value today is stated here, and uh, it's maybe interesting to note that this is one natural constant from which we are quite uncertain about the accuracy. You see the accuracy here given with plus minus 0.01%. Um, indeed, we do know better about the mass of an electron or proton uh, than from this universal gravitational constant. Now we can easily answer one of the questions. Um, why does a satellite stay in orbit? Very frequently, I hear the answer, gravitational force is equal to centrifugal force. Um, this is easy to understand, of course, from an engineering point of view, but physically wrong. Why is this the case? Well, just recall Newton's first law, um, stating that we have, uh, unless acted upon an unbalanced force, an object will maintain a constant velocity in magnitude and direction, and an orbiting satellite has not a constant velocity in direction. It's changing uh, continuously in the velocity direction as it is orbiting the Earth. So, the correct answer would be that the 
Gravity accelerates the satellite towards the Earth. However, because of its own velocity, the velocity of the satellite, it will never touch the Earth's surface. Um, the falling curve is um, uh, comparable to the curvature of the Earth radius, which means nothing else than that the satellite is in a continuous free fall around the Earth. This is from the Newtonian point of view and the correct answer, at least up to the time, times of Albert Einstein. Um, by the way, I should mention, uh, maybe to explain it more, um, more in detail, um, the centrifugal force is nothing else than um, an pseudo-force, so-called pseudo-force. It has no physical origin. The only force acting on the satellite is indeed the gravitational pull of the Earth in this case. Um, Albert Einstein was able to explain also the gravitational mass and the gravity force and within his um, uh, relativ relativity theory also the gravitational mass or the gravitational force is nothing else than a pseudo force um, which, which means nothing else than the, the gravity mass causes a curvature in space-time in which the satellite is caused to move. However, this is far beyond uh, the scope of this lecture. I will concentrate on the Newtonian world in the next. So, the first answer is easily given. Why does a satellite stay in orbit? Um, um, because of his own velocity relative to the gravitational pull acting on the satellite. And now you can easily ask, answer also the second question. Is an astronaut weightless? Well, an astronaut is nothing else than a satellite orbiting the Earth. So we can easily ask, answer um, an astronaut is not weightless, it's the gravitational pull is still acting uh, on, the, on the astronaut and similarly to the satellite is in a continuous free fall around the Earth. The next question is, which orbit types can be realized? Well, one of the basic equations in orbital mechanics is the so-called Visviva equation or energy conservation equation, which means nothing else um, than the, um, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of a satellite orbiting a central mass must be constant. If you um, discuss this equation more thoroughly, uh, it turns out the solutions for the possible orbit of this equation um, are so-called conic sections, which means nothing else than elliptical, parabolic, or hyperbolic orbits, as sketched here um, on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, this is a mathematical solution. The physical meaning is nothing else than um, an ellipse or a circle in a, in a certain uh, special case. It's nothing else than a closed orbit around the central mass, with A, by the way, in this equation being then the same major axis, or in for a circular orbit, um, A equaling the radius, the distance of the, of the orbiting object to the center um, of, the, of the Earth's mass in our particular case. A parabolic orbit would then be uh, an orbit which has at a certain distance r a velocity high enough to escape from the central mass, which means it has um, zero velocity relative to this mass in infinity. Uh, this is the right term in this equation I wrote here. And finally, a hyperbolic orbit would be um, an orbit which has um, at a certain distance r a velocity v which is high enough to escape from the central mass but having also a finite velocity higher than zero uh, in infinity relative to this mass. So with this equation we can easily see also calculate the velocities needed for example for circular orbit as sketched here v1, v2 and v3. Well the equation simplifies for circular velocity is nothing else than the square root of the um, product gamma, the universal gravitational constant, times the mass of the central body divided by the distance r of the uh, circular orbit. So we can 
easily see from this equation then that um, the closer you are to the central mass, the higher the velocity must be. Um, I should mention, of course, if you see the scheme here, uh, these are not orbits in physical space. The similar uh, procedure also for elliptical orbits. The equation is a little bit more longer because we have now a semi-major axis, not a symmetrical orbit. But um, you can easily explain here why the velocity at the perigee, the closest point to the Earth, must be the highest velocity, and why the velocity at the apogee, the maximum distance from the Earth's center, must be the smallest velocity. So, now we have also the answer which orbit types can be realized, namely elliptical orbits, in most cases for a closed orbit and around the central mass, we have answers that we have can also establish parabolic or hyperbolic orbits if we want to escape from this central mass. The question is now, which velocities do we need? Indeed, um, as a boundary, as a limit, to establish maybe a low Earth orbit. Yeah, so assume you're standing on a mountain, um, on a circular Earth, without any atmosphere, and you have um, um, uh, enough power to accelerate a ball, to throw a ball, which velocity would you need in order to establish a circular orbit uh, scratching the Earth's surface, so-called low Earth orbit? Well, no, nothing else than the Visviva equation um, with um, the, now the same major axis of the radius of the circular orbit equaling to the Earth radius, which can be measured. And if you calculate these velocities, um, the velocity you would need is 7.9 kilometers per second. This is, by the way, called the first cosmic velocity. If you have not the power uh, to accelerate in this direction, then you will have an elliptical orbit, which, is, uh, which has an intersection with the Earth's surface. It's falling back to the Earth. Um, if you have a higher velocity, then you will establish an elliptical orbit, as shown here. And the question is now, how fast must you accelerate um, the ball in order to escape from the gravitational pull, which means to go in the parabolic orbit? Well, again, use the Visviva equation for a parabola, now with the same major axis tending to infinity which turns now to have a velocity at the Earth's surface in order to escape from the gravitational pull, which equals to 11.2 kilometers per second. If you accelerate to a higher velocity, above 11.2 kilometers per second, then you will be on a hyperbolic orbit. So, finally, we now discussed also which velocities we need for accelerating to certain orbits. The last question, and also partly, partly task of the week, do we feel on Earth the gravitational pull of the Sun? Well, this, the answer is quite easy, quite comparable also to a satellite orbiting the Earth. Again, if you consider now the two bodies, Sun and Earth, with a certain distance to each other, um, the Earth having a relative velocity to the Sun, we can easily state, based on Newton's first law, again, that the gravitational pull on Earth from the Sun is compensated by a continuous free fall towards the Sun. It means nothing else that the entire Earth, you and I, are in a continuous free fall around the Sun. This is correct as long as we assume a point mass. Now, what happens if we consider a three-dimensional week, a uh, three-dimensional Earth? And this indeed is the task of the week, and I'll give you some assistance for um, this question. Um, assuming that we have a um, um, circular Earth, spherical Earth, um, dividing, having a distance to the sine of R, the radius of the Earth is giving. 
we can easily state that the mass element um, in the center of the Earth is being accelerated by the gravitational pull of the Sun towards the Sun and is compensated by a free fall of the Earth, um, which is equal to the accelerating uh, gravitational pull. Now the question is, what happens with the mass element closer to the Sun on this Earth's surface? And what happens to a mass element uh, which is farther away uh, from the center of, of the Earth? Um, and assuming that these mass elements are um, rigidly connected to the mass element in the center of the Earth, um, just think about this question, um, what the um, outcome would be. And also maybe what happens on the right hand and the right hand side of this scheme um, is again assuming that the free fall acceleration is the same as in the center of the Earth. What happens with the gravitational pull from the Sun at these certain points? For, well, this task of, of the week should be somehow more qualitatively. For those of you who are interested uh, to make a more quant quantitative assessment of this question, I've also given here the numbers for the mass of the Sun, the radius, the distance of the Sun to the Earth, and also the other values needed for calculating more thoroughly. Thank you very much.